Today I'll be sharing two short excerpts from Peter Smagorinsky's 2012 article, Vygotsky, Defectology and the Inclusion of People of Difference in the Broader Cultural Stream. This section is called Vygotsky's View of the Defect. In this section, I focus on what Vygotsky, 1993, considers to be a defect, a term his conception of human development generally disputes. In interrogating the phenomenon of blindness, Vygotsky argued that the absence of sight requires one to generate compensatory faculties, such that it is not merely a defect, a minus, a weakness, but in some sense is also the source of manifestations of abilities, a plus, a strength, page 97. In the section I outlined Vygotsky's 1993 definition of a defect, elaborate his views of the generative potential of the feelings of inadequacy to develop alternative means for engaging socially, and detail his views on what he considered to be the crucial problem of educating the extra-normal child, creation of a secondary disability produced through the social stigma that leads to feelings of inferiority, which to Vygotsky are the most deleterious consequences of physical or mental difference. Defining defect. In critiquing efforts provided by the special education approaches of his day, Vygotsky, 1993, asked, who could be reared from all this? Does this not sooner transform a normal child into a mentally retarded child rather than develop in the retarded child those mechanisms of behavior, psychology, and personality which have not yet meshed with the sharp teeth of life's intricate gears? Page 73. Vygotsky situated variations from the evolutionary norm in the context of his broader emphasis on human development, rather than taking the customary approach of attempting to amplify the underdeveloped or absent capacity toward the norm. It is extremely difficult to get rid of the philanthropic, invalid-oriented point of view for difference, he argued, page 75. Rather, he grounded his approach in efforts to assimilate people of difference into mainstream society by cultivating the potential of the whole person by means of roundabout means of mediation made available to achieve cultural ends. Vygotsky's approach was thus positive, optimistic, future-oriented, and dedicated to cultivating potential. No theory, he maintained, is possible if it proceeds from exclusively negative premises. Page 31. As such, Vygotsky, 1993, deliberately focused on difference rather than deficit. Kautik, Friedgut, and Friedgut, 2008, maintain that Vygotsky never called these children defective or handicapped, but referred to them as anomalous, insisting that properly nurtured, they could attain levels comparable to their peers. Reference Feigenberg, 1996, page 69. Kautik, Friedgut, and Friedgut ground this emphasis on the potential of the forsaken and the Old Testament value, written in Psalms 118.22, which Vygotsky, 1934, page 79, refers to in Thinking and Speech. The stone, rejected by the builders, has become the capstone of the corner. Vygotsky, 1993, built on this premise to argue that a child whose development is impeded by a deficit is not simply a child less developed than his peers, but is a child who has developed differently, age 30. This view reveals the developmental grounding of his approach to the whole of psychology. Compared to a fully functioning adult, perhaps a child of difference would be considered defective, given the absence or a minimal presence of a critical cognitive, motor, or sensory means for engaging the world. But a child, to Vygotsky, is a work in progress, one who can circumvent areas of difference to develop new capacities for a satisfying and productive life in society. Vygotsky's 1993 developmental emphasis stood in contrast to the biological perspectives on difference current in his day and still available. He critiqued those who viewed areas of difference as instances of biological defects. He was adamant about the misguided views of those who take a position that children develop along biological tracks, such that we may dismiss the laws determining the social development and the formation of a normal mind. This mechanistic notion is unfounded, methodologically speaking. 
Rather, he argued the appropriate approach is to consider the alliance of social and biological regularities in child development in a dialectical fashion. Page 124. The potential for more optimistic, future-oriented, and possibility-centered settings where development is available, he argued, and should become the focus of educational psychology and practice. In producing difficulties, a defect stimulates compensatory processes such that the child's physical and psychological reaction to the handicap is the central and basic problem. Indeed, the sole reality with which defectology deals. Vygotsky, 1993, page 32. To Vygotsky then, the defect is only a problem to be circumvent circumvented through other means. He believed that the mentally retarded child does not consist of gaps and defects alone. His organism as a whole is restructured. The personality as a whole is balanced out and compensated for by the child's developmental processes. Page 125. This emphasis on the whole of a child's personality and his or her physical and cognitive capabilities has separated him from those who viewed departures from the evolutionary norm as isolated problems to be treated directly. The comprehensive, integrated, potential oriented perspective that he took, in contrast, emphasizes the possibilities for culturally mediated developmental processes to produce capabilities that lead to fully productive lives in the social context. This next excerpt is titled, Discussion. Like many, I long considered Vygotsky's 1993 work on defectology to be a tangential strand of his work. My interest in mental health and its general characterization as a disabling condition, Smagorinsky, 2011, initially brought me in contact with his defectological writing. I now see Vygotsky's 1993 interest in creating a more inclusive society for people of difference as among the most compelling aspects of his theory of human development. Even for those who have no particular interest in biological departures from the evolutionary norm, this work makes an important contribution to his general comprehensive approach to culturally mediated developmental psychology and, I would argue, deserves greater attention than the paucity of citations it has garnered suggests. The notion of the secondary disability is profoundly important and ought to inform any educational program about any group of people, particularly those that include populations whose makeup requires adaptation through roundabout means. Vygotsky disputed the emphasis on biological orientations to human activity and development that dominated, dominated the psychology of his day, and his efforts continue to be carried out by those working in his tradition against the persistent belief that nature trumps nurture in human development. Just as Piaget's biological stage theories remain current in schools of education and other fields interested in the psychology of learning, Strictly intellectualistic views of mentation persist in perspectives in which cultural groups are characterized according to presumably innate static capabilities identified through measurements claimed to be culturally neutral. Example, Hernstein and Murray, 1994, whose conclusions about racially distributed intelligence inferred from intelligence tests remain influential in such groups as the Bradley and Heritage Foundation, the American Enterprise Institute, and other powerful private research organizations. Vygotsky's 1993 assertion that a primary cause such as the loss of sight is amenable to cultural mediation toward a society's higher mental functions is, in contrast to biological determinism, a hopeful and future-oriented way of recognizing departures from the evolutionary norm. Concerned him should concern 21st century educators as well. The effects of being treated as a lesser person through society's assumption that difference is tantamount to deficit, a problem that helps create the devastating secondary disability of feeling inferior, helpless, dependent, and in need to pity and charity. Vygotsky's solution to this problem was twofold to provide alternative means of mediation for people of difference and just as importantly, to re-educate people to view difference more equitably and generously so as to reduce or eliminate the social context that produces the secondary disability of stigma and low self-esteem. 
This argument is not only important in such fields as special education, but in all areas of cultural difference. In contrast to Hernstein and Murray's 1994 view that factors such as race are correlated with degrees of intelligence, researchers such as Moll, 1990, find that departures from society's norms do not represent deficient ways of being, but rather they represent forms of activity designed to suit specific cultural goals. Thus, when Latino students drop out of school at disproportionate rates, instead of concluding that they lack the intelligence to succeed academically, he argues that schools are not responsive to the ways in which they have learned to learn in their home and community settings. His solution, similar to Vygotsky's, is to re-educate the educators about the students' home lives so as to inform their teaching in culturally responsive ways. Vygotsky's work thus has relevance for any population considered by the dominant group to be deficient, whether as consequence of biology or culture. Another implication of Vygotsky's 1993 defectological writing is his insight that human development involves the integration of, whole, of the whole of the individual's functioning in relation to cultural mediation. Toward this end, he provides one of his most powerful and overlooked arguments for the integration of mind and body, affect and cognition, and mind and society. The construct of the secondary disability serves as a nexus for these related factors. Mind and body are interrelated to the extent that a biological difference may be adapted in one's appropriation of a society's higher mental functions, such that one experiences difference in positive ways that frame new experiences in hopeful and empowering ways. The foregrounding of affect in the developmental process in conjunction with the possibility of engaging in satisfying cultural labor is a critical aspect of Vygotsky's formulation that can inform any consideration of the role of difference in integrating one's work in a broader, future-oriented, constructive cultural stream. One implication that Vygotsky overlooks is the possibility that a society may be headed in a destructive direction. His own Soviet society, like the Nazi movement that was underway at the time of his death, is predicated on the elimination of dissensus through violent means. Video cultures, such as the current wave of militia groups in the U.S., similarly have violent, hateful goals that they impress on their young. Vygotsky, 1993, speaks of the young patriot and young communist movements in the Soviet Union, which he saw as positive ways to acculturate children of difference into the collective's forward movement. Even in his lifetime, however, the vision of a Soviet utopia had begun to fragment into totalitarianism. The teleological goals of a society then do not necessarily provide the ideal medium for human development, even if they might provide powerful means of and incentives for inclusion. No setting can be created unproblematically, as Saracen 1972 has argued in relation to schools. Indeed, optimism can blind planners to the inevitable problems that arise and in turn contribute to the failure of designs to work as planned. Gotsky's 1993 vision of a humane approach to difference serves more as a blueprint for broad societal action than a specific educational program. Undertaking his project undoubtedly would involve extraordinarily extensive re-education of teachers and other collaborators about the potential for roundabout means of mediation for producing ultimate social inclusion for those who depart from the evolutionary norm. Achieving this goal on even a modest level, however, would result in profoundly more satisfying lives for people of difference in society, regardless of its ideology. For that, it is an effort worth making.